Welcome to the March no monthly meeting. So I think uh, a lot of us have become familiar with the, our typical agenda. Today's plan is to be quite interactive. Please join in. Uh, you can probably just speak up when you've got something to say. If it's us getting too noisy, we'll ask people to, to raise hands, but uh, to start off with, is, uh, make, it, make it informal and interactive. We'll go through our usual uh, agenda of uh, a bit of time for win of the month and today I learned um, stories. Uh, we have a few announcements. We'll see if there are other announcements kind of in the in the room. And then our topic of the day, I see Oliver is uh, here with us uh, and ready. Um, and I'm he's here. going to tell us about uh, remote development in NERSC shifter containers with Visual Studio Code. So this is something I'm quite uh, excited about. I think this is a, a good direction for HPC generally, you know, to enable some of these, uh, I, I guess, newer technologies that um, you know, software developers are you know, becoming uh, accustomed to uh, enabling them on, on HPC. So I think that'll be really good. Uh, then we'll have a quick look at uh, what's coming up and then uh, some metrics from last month. Oh, and uh, just a heads up, of course, we're recording the meeting. We'll post the recording on the website afterwards. If you prefer not to appear in a recorded meeting, uh, probably the way to go is just to yeah, leave the camera off and, and you know, stick to talking by chat. But otherwise, I yeah, hope people can join in. So, win of the month. The purpose of this segment is an opportunity to show off an achievement or to shout out an achievement that you know about that uh, yeah, somebody else who uses NERSC has, has uh, you know, managed. And this can be you know, big or small, uh, yeah, from having a paper accepted somewhere, solve a bug that's been you know, uh, <laughs> causing, causing difficulties and blockages or always just like a, you know, an interesting bug you know, you know, with, a, with a surprising um, you know, cause and, and solution. Um, scientific achievements are great to hear about. Um, these might actually be a candidate for uh, science highlights, which NERSC uh, presents to the Department of Energy, I think monthly. Um, and also we have annual uh, awards for high impact scientific achievement and innovative use of high performance computing. Um, anybody like to start us off? Got some stories about uh, wins. See, I can I can get the ball rolling kind of on something. This is this is halfway between win of the month and today I learned something that's been occupying my attention in the last few weeks has been setting up uh, yeah, spec environments and workflows for installing software and trying to make the, the whole process of that easier. And uh, you know, anybody who's uh, installed you know, large software stacks knows that it can be quite complex. There's, there's you know, a mess of dependencies to unravel. Uh, and the aim of spec is to make this easier. And, you know, and of course, every time though that you you add a layer of kind of you know abstraction and tooling. There's yeah, more stuff to learn, more stuff to to yeah, more stuff that can go wrong as well. So uh, it's it's been improving sort of yeah quite well over the last little while, and and yeah more and more things uh, install more smoothly. And you know what I've been finding is uh, especially using the, it's got this feature called a build cache, which is really handy for sort of separating out the the building of stuff from the deployment of stuff and you know able to set up a, a kind of a workflow where you know, make an environment uh, build a bunch of stuff locally where it's kind of you know easy to do and then package it all up into essentially a binary cache that can then just be unpacked anywhere which is a, a great way of handling sort of deployment of software as separate from the installing um, so we actually have uh, a few kind of docs on this because yeah, you can use it. You can also use it to find packages, yeah, module loads back and then 
uh, spec load and you can kind of bypass the module system and, and specify exactly what it is that you want to load. So if you look for it on our, on our docs, you can find a bunch of stuff. Another sort of uh, interesting aspect to it is uh, it's kind of tied in with the E4S stack. So uh, now on Corey and on Perlmutter, I think you need to load the, the, a specific spec module. It's not the default yet. Uh, and you do uh, spec, spec, and the thing that you're interested in, if it's part of the E4S stack, what you should get is the spec that's been, you know, kind of get tested and recommended by the E4S project. So, so that's my kind of, yeah, interesting, uh, yeah, something of a success story in the last uh, little bit. I see Richard's posted some notes in the chat about uh, a science highlight. Uh, Nature.com article. Uh, Richard, do you want to tell us about it? Um, sure. We, we get these um, highlights we send to Oscar so they can talk about the interesting, some of the interesting things that North users are doing. Um, from time to time, and, and this was one of the more recent ones where um, through simulations and uh, able to put um, additional constraints on, on the axion mass, um, which is one of the, the primary candidates for, for dark matter. Um, and so um, I don't know too much about the details, but uh, um, they had a, a th uh, says a three order of Three unit of magnitude, or it, 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 improving the dynamic range in, in the simulations, and providing evidence for an axial mass between 40 and 80 micro electron volts, um, down from the range of 25 to 500. So it put stronger constraints on, on what the mass of them um, could be. Nice. Okay. So this was using, looks like a, a QCD code. And no, 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 this is one of NERSC's yeah. projects, or one of the projects running at NERSC's. Yeah, it was more like a um, <clears throat> what's going on in the, in the early universe. And using AMR to get um, final resolution. Yeah. Nice work. And yeah, a nature publication is. Uh, is quite hard to get and oh yeah, quite hard to achieve. So good on them. I see uh, coaches made a comment in chat. Uh, demo presentation for SPAC. Actually, you know, that's probably a, a good thought. I think we have had one in the past, but it was a while ago and there were definitely more sharp edges and they're, they're smoothing out now. But I'll take note of that as a, as a topic for uh, an upcoming topic. Would anybody else like to uh, shout something out? We can move on to the, the flip side of that coin, which is uh, today I learned. I guess I should go back to the, the slide screen. Um, so the other side of um, win of the week, is something that you learn. Um, you know, what, what surprised you that might benefit others to hear about? And you know, this is where we can kind of celebrate the things that didn't work so well, yeah, it was well as well as just the, you know, the interesting things that we stumbled across and read. But uh, yeah, every time something doesn't work, it's, it's usually a, it's a step towards something that does. You know, discovering something that doesn't work kind of teaches you more about you know, how it works underneath and can uh, you know, improve knowledge overall as well. Uh, also, giving other people a heads up about it can uh, get the next person there a little more quickly without having to fight through the, the bug or the difficulty. So this is an opportunity to talk about uh, something that you've learned in the easy way or the hard way. Coaching. 
Oh yeah, um, so this is poetry. I don't have the answer yet, but and this is very probably basic things to do on Koi night running. Um, just uh, trying, I've been running the model with pure MPI uh, parallelism so far, and I'm now testing with open MPI and MPI combined because I'm learn more and more open PI in the context of GP offloading. But for Cori night landing uh, for now, uh, I think uh, so far I've tested uh, different combination of MPI tasks per node and uh, threads per node. And most of the time <laughs> using open PI slows down in the simulation. And uh, looking into the code, it does have you know, open MP uh, parallel for loop is sort of important part of the, of the model code. And it's not that big chunk of, you know, uh, for loop, but it's really nice, smaller set of uh, for loops. But, so I haven't found any, any anything to try. And I do follow, uh, you know, mine asks a you know, job. Uh, script generator using that so that you know the thread and task are spread it spread across the core. Uh, the, but the, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah, I wonder if anybody has uh, very experience so quickly you know speed up <laughs> uh, um, running core with hybrid MPI and uh, open MP and any. Um, particular best practice that may not covered in the documentation. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. How do you, how do you find the, the sweet spot that actually gets you more out of using combined MPI and uh, OpenMP together? Um, so we, we definitely have a, you know, a, a bit of knowledge about that at NERSC. Um, anybody else want to, Say something first, though. So one big thing I think that we've noticed is, especially in the, the early stages of moving code to OpenMP, um, it, it can take a little bit before you actually get speed up because um, you know, you're sort of using yeah, multiple models now. So you're probably using fewer MPI tasks because you're using some of those CPUs for OpenMP. But there's also a, a good chance that there's not as much coverage of the code with uh, OpenMP yet as there is with MPI. Is that a, is that a fair guess as to the, the situation with this code? Uh, it was hard to just decide from looking at the code, but it does cover you know, good chunk of, uh, you know, runtime fraction of, of uh, runtime, you know, which, yeah, how, how many uh, minutes or hours spent on certain components and those components at the top level is covered by uh, OpenMP uh, parallel. So, but uh, yeah, I'm sort of organizing all the test simulations. I ran into the graph and uh, my plans to again get contact with the uh, help desk folks. And then once we figure out, maybe I can come back and uh, um, report on uh, one of those next energy uh, lab meeting. But, you know, yeah. And, uh, okay. Just a moment, and this is going. <clears throat> Coach. Hi. Uh, uh, how many MPI ranks do you run? I tried uh, less than 2,000 to 12,000 MPI tasks. And that should be a decent uh, one. So what's the, the your, uh, uh, what's that? <laughs> Open MP mm -hmm. per node. How many uh, that uh, shared memory thread you run? I tried for one. I mean, pure MPI and then four threads and per process and eight threads per process and 16 threads per process. And okay, how many cores? This is maybe for Steve. How many cores do we have? I mean, hardware cores per node 
Um, I on guess this is for Corey, right? Uh, this is the KNL. So, yeah. Um, How many? I think it's close to 100. So, so our KNL nodes have got 68 cores per node. Um, and each core can do uh, kind of hyper threading up to four way. But of course, when you're doing hyper threading, so that means you, you'll, you'll see a CPU count of 272. Um, yeah, let's, but there's uh, only 60, 68 actual cores. So that yeah. the hyper threads are just sharing those cores, like you're yeah, sharing the I, same I, core. At this point, uh, that is not good for performance for that particular application. So avoid using uh, uh, you know, hyper threading. Just yeah. one thread per okay. core. So you have six, uh, 64 cores, right? Right. And can you try that? Let's say you give uh, 32 cores. Use mm -hmm. 32 cores mm -hmm. per node. Mm -hmm. And each core run one thread, mm -hmm. and then go to thousands of uh, MPI ranks for that, uh, and see what you get. Maybe I can take this offline work with you and see, because yeah. we yeah. probably need some breakdown to understand what's going on. Yeah, that particular one I haven't tried. Yeah, and uh, I'll give it a try. And I have a bunch of uh, yeah simulations. Maybe I can share that with you later. Um, yeah. Graphs yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so I kind of wonder if what uh, Dongle is hinting at there is that the way that the cores are arranged on KNL is that each pair of cores share uh, it makes a tile and shares an L2 cache. So by only using half of the cores, if it's a really uh, cache kind of intensive yeah. program, um, you might actually get better performance just because the you know the, the, the single threads are able to use more cores. Another thing to take a look at is your uh, affinity settings and make sure that they're yeah good. I I'm also outputting by having some of the environment variable for MP of MP. So all the log file has the affinity information in there, which I can also show you guys uh, later. Yeah. Am I really using in good affinity? Yeah. And, and then finally is uh, to uh, try running with some performance tools. Uh, it, it starts getting a little bit into the weeds here, but things like VTune can be quite helpful for, for identifying why it's not going as fast. But yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a big and interesting topic. Yeah, I haven't tried VTune. Okay, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for the tip. Can give you a try. So yeah, we'll be we'll be interested to to hear uh, afterwards uh, what you found to be the the primary bottleneck, and you know what worked in terms of speeding it up. Yeah, yeah, which I don't know at this time, but um, really eager to, mm. to find it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Gucci. Um, before we move on to announcements and, and CFPs, anybody else like to call out something that they've either solved or haven't solved or stumbled across? Okay, uh, let's move on to announcements and CFPs. So the big one that uh, probably everybody has noticed is that Corey was out yesterday for maintenance and it was a fairly major maintenance with a OS upgrade and a new default environment. And I see I have a, a typo in the slide here. Um, excuse the spelling. Um, most things probably will just work, but it is recommended that anything statically linked will almost certainly, well, you're very likely need relinking because there's a a different version of uh, glibc basically underlying it. So yeah, there might be changes in the interface. Um, most dynamically linked things probably should just work, um, but uh, it, you know, it is worth doing a, you know, a quick test before you run a, a big job. Uh, and you know, it's also probably a good op updating to newer versions of things. The, oops, my uh, audio battery is run out. The default, everybody is doing okay? That okay. Like it. Yeah, you. Yep. Um, turn my volume up at this end. 
Um, what was I going to say? Oh, uh, a majority of um, modules and software that was on Cori before had, is, uh, is still there now, updated for the new OS. There's a few things that are still in the works and a, and a handful of things that were deprecated. If you, uh, you know, find those uh, essential things either missing or discover any issues, yeah, please let us know at uh, yeah, help.nest.gov. Um, other announcements. Summer internship time is uh, coming up soon. So if you are or have a student that's looking for a summer internship, NERSC has got uh, quite a few projects. You can take a look at uh, this site here, nurse.gov research and development internships for a list of um, you know, some of the projects that NERSC is uh, looking for interns for and uh, join the program. Uh, and new announcement that uh, didn't quite make it into the weekly email this week, but um, we now have a global endpoint available for Perlmutter Scratch and under docs.nurse.gov, uh, you can find the connection details. Uh, a few things coming up that we know of, there's uh, training on coding for GPUs using standard C++ in uh, early April. The next Ideas ECP webinar on evaluating performance portability for HPC apps and benchmarks uh, is in mid-April. And we have a spin-up workshop starting sort of mid to late April. So spin-up is NERSC's um, kind of you know, edge infrastructure, container-based uh, infrastructure service, which is uh, uh, yeah, providing a lot of um, yeah, services, yeah, like, yeah, like science gateways and uh, kind of, yeah, HPC supporting services that uh, a lot of projects use. So if you'd like to you know, learn about that and use it, you can uh, sign up, uh, check weekly email for details and your yeah, connection links there. That is, that is the ones that I know about. Are there any others that people would like to announce? Uh, CFPs, things coming up. Conferences that uh, nurse users might like to join. And if not, we'll go on to our topic of the day, which is uh, remote development in NERSC shifter containers with Visual Studio Code, thanks to uh, Oliver Schultz from Max Planck Institute of Physics. Um, I think this is a, a topic that is going to interest a lot of people. And yeah, I, I see it's uh, yeah, it's attracted a, a pretty good audience. I think it's an exciting direction for HPC to go. Uh, Oliver, would you like to share your screen? Yeah. yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So I will have to share and unshare back and forth a lot because uh, there will be several VS Code windows involved. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay. Uh, I put a link in the chat to the documentation we now have in the official nurse docs about how to do this. And I just discovered I have to uh, do a pull request with one or two bug fixes, but uh, I'll, I'll mention them here. So, uh, right. So the first thing you do is you need to tell VS Code, uh, how you want to SSH. Oh, my. first of all, maybe I should say what this is about. <laughs> so the goal here is to do remote development with Visual Studio Code, but in a way that the remote part of Visual Studio Code that will run at NERSC will run inside of a shifter container with your whole software stack available while the actual Visual Studio Code user interface will just run on your local institute system, laptop, wherever you are, and, and so on. And, and we want to do this in a, in a seamless fashion, uh, at least as seamless as possible. So uh, if you've used Visual Studio Code, you know that there's this, um, or you probably know that there's this remote SSH extension that allows you to SSH into a different system. Um, that is especially convenient if on your local system, well, I, will, I will always stress to uh, try to stress what you do locally and what you do remotely. 
on your local system, if you have an SSH config file, you can make some aliases that make it easy and quick to log into host, right? For example, here in general for permuter, I say which, which uh, identity file it should use. So I don't uh, have to do this two factor auth all the time. And then I say, okay, on Cori, that's this login host and this is my username and permuter that's that login host and that username. Now I can say, connect to host. And I say, uh, Cori, for example, and I just wanna connect to Cori. Now comes the sharing and unsharing part. So I see that uh, Sebastian has a question in the chat and I wonder if um, what you just showed was related to that about what's the difference to just remote SSHing. You mean remote SSHing with Visual Studio? Well, welcome. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Sorry, maybe I'm a bit too early, too quick with this question. You're probably gonna answer it anyway. So this is now, as you can see down here, a remote SSH connection to Cori in Visual Studio Code, right? So if I open a terminal, uh, I'm on Cori. So I'm not on my local laptop anymore, right? Uh, and I can open files. For example, I can open local bin. And there I actually have local bin and here at Cori, I also have a, a file that I call run shifter. This is also in the in the nurse docs that are linked. Uh, the thing is you need to set this environment variable. So you can't just call shifter directly. You have you need a little wrapper script and you can make one yourself. Though I have having some problem on Perlmutter with this one. And I will also link you later to a bit of a more extensive uh, script that, that does a few more things for you. But basically, this is just start shifter with this image file and reroute this xdg runtime directory first, because normally that is under slash run something and shifter doesn't mount that into the container instance. And Visual Studio likes to put, put a link there to the running instance and stuff like that. Okay, so you need this little run shifter script. So now on Cori, you can just say local bin run shifter and then some container name we have an experiment that's called legend it's a gym it's a double uh, neutrinos double beta decay and this is why my, my container is legend base within the legend x organization so i can call run shifter and and that's of course fine and i'm in my container in which for example i have julia available right whereas julia is not available without loading any modules on Cori natively. So I'm really in that container, right? Okay, so now what I would like to do is not make an SSH connection and then open a terminal and then start shifter. That works of course, but the problem is I can't start this container in my remote SSH on Cori. I can work here nicely fine. Now, where's Julia? Julia is in the container in opt local bin Julia. Okay, so that's fine. But outside of the container, that of course doesn't exist, which means if I want to look into some Julia standard packages into the source code with my file manager, I can't because this file system is not available, right? I can't, I can't get there. Visual Studio code lives outside of the container. And all these nice integration things that Julia and Python and all the other languages give you is only partially available. For example, because a language service in Visual Studio Code cannot parse part of the language stack because it's not available. So what we wanna do is we want this remote component of Visual Studio Code running inside of Shifter. Okay, so we'll close this approach. Note that you do have to have such a run, uh, such a run Shifter script, okay? We close this remote connection and we go back to what we had before. So on your local system, you set up your um, identity file 
and just in general how to log in into Cori and Perlmutter. But now you can also specify remote commands. And so what I say here is if my host name is some image tilde something, then in, in addition to running SSH, please run a remote command first. Do this home local bin run shifter and then start my container. If I wouldn't have to set this XDG runtime, I could just call shifter here directly, but this is why I need this wrapper script. And uh, you should request a TTI because due to this, due to this, this construction, you, otherwise you don't have a terminal. So now you can already do this. I cannot say SSH, some image till the Cori. And this is, and I'm in my container. I have my opt file system that's part of the container and so on. So that's already nice, completely independently of Visual Studio Code. You can SSH into a container running at NERSC. Um, one more thing you have to do. Here you declare some image tilde anything, run this remote command, but how, how in the world do you tell SSH that that is a host name? Well, SSH just allows you in a host specification to just give multiple aliases for any name. So here I just have a bunch of alias names that all just connect to Cori, but I can tell SSH that if the host name starts like this to also add the remote command. Of course, you could also have a complete separate entry for each of these in your SSH config, but it would get kind of long and this way you can structure it somewhat better. It's still a bit painful, but it's, 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 it's manageable if you get, get used to it. So basically here, do you define your images? And yes, you have to repeat each of them one time here as a host alias. The cool thing is that now you can say, connect to host, connect to Cori. And now I can already select, do I just want Cori or do I want to go into some container image at Cori? So now I say I want to be in some container image Cori. And I'm not quite sure why this is so slow. I tested that just a minute ago. There we go. Now, if I open the shell, Julia is already there. I am in the container. And if I want to look there, I can look there. Uh, ah, um, now it opened. Ah, I hate. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't share the. Uh, I was going to say, I think something froze on your screen. Possibly. I am sorry. I didn't share the other screen. So what, <laughs> what opened now? I, I, I do apologize. Uh, what opened now? Which one is it now? And I just have to find the right, I have so many open and the share screen function, unfortunately. Uh, no, not that one. Actually this one, maybe we just close, we won't need it anymore. So what you're um, finding it, I noticed that the responsiveness really is quite fast. You know, the, yes, it the, is, and I, I, will, I, will, I will tell yeah. why in a moment. Uh, the, the Microsoft guys, and so the VS Code team, they really took care of making this a nice experience. So I'm in Germany, and the ping to NERSC is actually not that great. And this is over a DSL connection from home, actually. So when I type, if you look very closely, you will see that the letter first appears in a darker gray before it becomes a brighter gray. That's a fairly recent function in Visual Studio that if you have a remote connection, when you type a letter in the terminal, it appears immediately in a darker gray. And then when the basically the confirmation comes back, 
that the letter was accepted. So when the ping basically comes back from the terminal, then it is made light gray. And this makes typing on the terminal a, a fairly smooth experience now, even if there's like 100, 200 milliseconds lag or even a bit more. So now, I, as you can see, now SSH says, I'm on a host called some image Cori, which was just an alias for Cori, but it tells it, please run this remote SSH command. And now Julia is there and I opened this already. So this is now in the opt, opt Julia bin. So I can actually open these folders now in Visual Studio Code. So I can now look into the Julia libraries, right? Yeah, Julia base. I can look into Julia source code. So now when I say, and I can also, the same with Python, I'm just more used to Julia. If I now say, open a Julia repo, oh, we haven't enabled the right Julia extension. So we say install the Julia extension in some image Cori, install this extension. Now I can't start the Julia, I can start the Julia REPL and I will be dropped into a Julia command line. So I don't have to run the container first because this whole remote instance of Visual Studio Code runs in a container. I will get out of here now because I have a slightly more luxurious one that I want to show you that uses a, a bit of a better container run script, so to speak, where I reroute several Julia directories to the place I'm used to so that I can, can also plot and stuff like that. Was, was the implication of that extra step where, where the, the remote client was running inside the container uh, is that when you installed the package into Julia, it was installed into your .julia on Cori as opposed to on your home system, is that? Right, everything is on Cori. The only thing that runs on my home system is the Visual Studio Code user interface. So that's basically like, uh, it, like a glorified web browser. It, most of it is actually written in web technology, right? Yeah. So um, I can now start a Julia REPL and I will be in my container, right? So I'm in the shifter container. So if I say using plots, and now, now the fun begins. It takes a moment. And I plot something. Again, people who know Julia know about time to first plot and why it's annoying. Uh, but everything else will come fast. In the meantime, one setting that you have to do There we are. So, and this plot now pops up. So I'm on a remote system, but I can work fully graphically. I can even say, let's say, I want to invert a matrix. And uh, well, I want to invert a matrix. And that will take a while, not long. It just takes a moment. Let's make it a bit more of a challenging problem. And now, where do I lose the time? So I want to profile this. So I'd say prof view, and this is running at NERSC. And again, the graphical profile of what I've called and where the code was, I can even here look in the RAND and I can shift control click on that, which will drop me into the random JL source code, which is an opt Julia 1.7, that is a Julia standard library that I'm looking at here with a profiler. <clears throat> if Visual Studio Code, the remote component would not be running in the container, Visual Studio Code would not be able to open that file. Right? That is the difference between remote SSHing and then opening the container and really fully working in the container. You can do stuff like that. I wanna say RAND uh, 200, I can, I can ask which, which, where is this defined? But I can actually say, well, I haven't, I can't, I can't edit Julia core code, but if I had checked that out for development, I could say at edit, 
and I get dropped. Yes, yes, yes. Open, fine. I trust this. I get dropped into exactly this file, right? Or this invert, this invert. I could directly edit this standard library code, right? I might have to reload because it's standard library and Julia hot, hot code reloading doesn't touch the standard library, but if it was my own package, I would be in there. So this full connection with the Julia language server or with the Python, the Python language server and Julia plotting respectively for Python would be Python plotting. And I don't think Python has a tool exactly like this, but in general, this full functionality, like you would have it on your local system, you now have transparently on a remote system and you don't even notice that you're working remotely anymore. In fact, if you open a, even if you open a folder, let's say, uh, Open. Uh, let's open something that has a Git repository. The only annoying thing is that it will again open a new, oh no, it actually did it in this window. Uh, I can highly recommend in general, the, the Git graph extension. It's just wonderful. Uh, and now I am in this Git repository on Cori, and I can look at the history and I can say Git graph. And again, even though it's a graphical app, so to speak, that's run in visual code, I get this graphics remotely over the connection. I can say, oh, create branches, check out branches. Working with Git remotely finally has become pleasant. And that to me is a, is a huge thing. Uh, what you need to do, I, I did put that in the instructions. In addition, you need to you need to do one thing in the settings. In the Visual Studio settings, you have to uh, where is it? Maybe I don't see this now. In the Visual Studio Code preferences, you have to do as is remote SSH enable remote command. This is currently an experimental feature, and you need the latest version of Visual Studio Code to do this. Um, this this you have to enable, and there's two other things that that are default settings, but that you must not change. I will add that to the documentation. You can find this whole thread where this came from and how this started here. I'll put this in the chat as well. All right. Yeah. Um, let me just find this link quickly. So this was several people begging Microsoft, especially the Microsoft Zurich team that does Visual Studio Code to please allow other containers than Docker. Um, and finally, we have this solution. You have to scroll right, right to the end. Uh, I want to give a big shout out here to Luigi Pertoldi, who actually had the idea to, to use this remote command when it came out very recently. Before that, we had to work in, uh, do an even more clunky workaround that you will with a, with a local custom SSH script that you will also find in this, in this GitHub thread. Uh, yeah, so look at this nurse, nurse docs link. It, every, every step is there. You don't have to do much. You have to install the remote SSH extension. You have to enable, uh, you have to tell uh, Visual Studio Code to use uh, SSH remote command. And uh, as you will find at the end of the GitHub thread, and I will add that to the docs, you must, you must leave user local server on the default value, which is true. But if you haven't changed those defaults, there's, there's no problem. Now, one thing I do here, I don't use this, for this demo, I didn't use this simple, uh, this simple run, run, uh, run shifter script. I use a more, a, more, a more complex script, which we call cnth, container env that also redirects a few directories. Well, if, you, if you look at, 
it will also redirect, for example, Python user base to user local, and it will redirect several user, Julia things also to user local, and it will redirect several Jupyter things to user local. And this magical slash user directory is actually physically located in home.cnf. In this case, I call this container legend user and gets automatically bind mounted in shifter into the slash user, which is nice because that means Python especially likes to use absolute paths and packages. And that means you can move complete Python installations from one, one site to another site because it's always under slash user because CM supports shifter and it supports singularity. So you can take these directories and basically use them on different computing sites and you really have full mobility of compute and that has worked out quite well for us. If you want to give that a try, I'll give you the link. Um, yeah, can you can you show us the setup file that you used to enable this uh, CN? You said it was slightly different. Yes, from the the, that is, you just need this script here. I put the link in the chat. It's just a, it's just a CN, it's just a bash script. And the only thing you do is in your home directory, you make a directory CN. And then for each container environment that you want to use, you make a directory. And in that directory, you put a file called rootfs.shifter, which contains the container name. And then you can just use, can just do cn's container name, and it will look up which shifter container it actually is and do lots of bind mounting. It will also, by the way, mount there's also home dear, which is your home directory, but now mounted under a neutral absolute path and it redirects the few environment variables. So I had trouble with the simple run. I will continue to, to work on that, but I had, for some reason, I had trouble with this simple run shifter script that just sets EDG uh, runtime uh, on, on Perlmutter, though on Cori, it seems to work well. Uh, but this this CN seems to work well on Perlmutter too. It just bind mounts a few more things. Uh, I just didn't put it in the legend docs because it's kind of a, a personal project and it's not that terribly well documented. And though there is uh, 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 there is no CNs because I'm in the container. Uh, yeah, there is no. <laughs> There's no executable, so I can't show you this in the in the container. But we can we can go back to the original config. Uh, uh, just a moment, I'll share again. So so all that sharing, um, you've obviously got. Uh, yeah, pretty nice development environment set up in a container that you can use on Cori. Do you then use uh, Docker or something similar on your, your on your on your laptop when you're developing things locally? No, I I run uh, I use Singularity on my laptop. Yep. Uh, and I use the same CM script on my laptop, so I actually really actually run the same environment on my laptop at home, and I can run the same environment at NERSC. And I can share this user directory with Julia packages installed and everything if I want, because no matter what the actual path of my home directory is in the container, it will always be under slash user. Uh, yeah. so, so instead for this legend, instead of run shifter, I just use the other run script, which is also just a bash script. It just does more stuff, um, but there's no magic about it. And you don't have to use long container names because it looks in home slash cn in this file what the container is actually named. So you can then do can SSH to Cori. So if, if people are interested in trying it out, I will just show that there are actually at least some docs. Um, so it does have an online help, even though there's no readme on GitHub yet, but there is there is online help for it. 
And I can do the same stuff on my local system. So here I can also use C and legend. And I'm in this environment. Only here, this is my laptop, right? And I have the slash user directory. And then I can do SSH legend till the Cory. And it's exactly the same container, only the one container is a Docker image converted to singularity and the other is a Docker image converted to shifter. And I can do slash user. In this case, they're actually not synchronized, but it is bind, bind mounted just the same. And the physical location is home.cnf.legend. And that's where this file is that says what the, here it is root fs shifter, which is just a text file. And on my own system, on my laptop, it's yeah. Uh, it is instead instead of a text file, it's a sim link that's called root of S S I F that links to the actual somewhat longish singularity image file. So I could, have, I could have both this link in uh, and the text file with the shifter container name and CN will check if shifter or singularity is installed and then pick the one or the other. Uh, but I don't think there are many sites besides NERS that, that, that use shifter. So this allows us actually in legend because on other sites we use singularity that allows us to use the same container image converted different ways and have one common syntax to call containers. But this CN stuff is absolutely not necessary for for this uh, remote SSH container integration with, with VS Code. It's just something that combines nicely with it because you can use shorter container names and you have a bit more luxury and you have separation between, uh, you, have, you have separation between containers, which is the last thing I wanted to show. Purposefully, I hid this from you until now because this is the only kind of ugly thing about it. One more thing that you should do in your VS code settings file, again, this is in the NERSC docs, you have to tell it where to install the VS code server. Because by default, it will be installed on the remote side in slash dot VS code server. And when you exit, VS code leaves the remote server instance running. So if I would, if I would SSH to Cori, not into a container, it would start a remote server. Then I would close that VS code window and I would say, now please SSH to, to some image Cori and it would find the existing image and it would, instead of starting a new server in the container address, reuse the server that runs outside of the container. This way we can force VS code to actually install different versions with different config files in different containers. And then I can really do this, I can, Say SSH connect to host. Well, actually I showed this before. So I can connect to some image Cori and other image Cori and legend Cori. And I will be on the same physical Cori host because Cori typically puts me on the same host for the same user if I connect within the same hour or so. So I have several VS code instances running on the same Cori host on the same Cori node, but because they run in different VS code directories or at NERSC, they really separate and they can really run in parallel. So again, a big, big thanks to, to Luigi Pertoli who figured out this, this neat trick. Uh, we've, been, we've been lobbying on this GitHub thread from, for Microsoft to please, please let us set this with an environment variable because then the container run script could just take care of it. But so far this, this is the only way. Again, this is in the docs. So the steps you have to do, local SSH config file to say, okay, for some special host names, please run a remote command and then make these host names aliases for where you actually wanna go. On the other side, on the NERC side, you need some container run script that at least sets this XGG runtime and maybe does something more. And the third ingredient is activating respect for remote SSH commands in the VS code settings and telling it where to put the server component of VS code and forcing it to put in different directories for different images. 
I think I went way over time here. <laughs> I know it's a, it seems a bit fiddly. I can promise though that the result is, is really worth it because I, even when I work locally, I now actually remote SSH to localhost so that I can work in my shifter container and in my singularity container. And it, it is fully seamless. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I'm quite keen to uh, give that a try, try setting that up. Um, so yeah, we, we do only have about two or three minutes left. What we might do is run very quickly through our last uh, couple of normal items, and then people who do have time and want to stick around, if Oliver has uh, a little longer, can sure. uh, stick around for further questions. I can stick around. So quick look at coming up, we've got a few uh, topics lined up for the next uh, few months, and we're always looking for more, especially topics uh, like this one, where uh, you know, a NERSC user can tell us about, you know, a, a, a way that you use NERSC or, you know, something interesting uh, you know, about your work um, that you know, will be interesting and, and beneficial to other NERSC users. Oh, I realize I hadn't actually shared the screen yet. Um, so we've yeah, a couple of uh, topics coming up. A quick look at last month's numbers. Corey had no outages at all, scheduled or unscheduled. We canceled the maintenance in preparation for the, you know, the, the major one that happened yesterday. Palmer only had its uh, scheduled maintenance outage. We normally run through a few other figures here, and this is going to be a discussion for another week, I think. But uh, just to think about what kind of metrics and numbers are people here interested in seeing as an overview of the last month? So that's the end of our uh, your formal part of the meeting. Um, John Mack here, thank you all for joining us. Um, and please feel free to uh, yeah, leave as you need to, but uh, if you would like to stick around a little for uh, a bit of a Q and A with Oliver about the VS Code setup, um, before we get yeah, a few more minutes, we can go over time for that. So if people want to try this out and run into trouble, I'll put my email address in the chat. Feel free to, to hit me up either here or on the NERSC Slack. Yeah, yeah the NERSC Slack is probably a, a good way to go there. So I, just, I, I really like this idea of setting up the same development environment for use you know, online and offline, so to speak, um, when you're know, preparing with, with Corey and not. So quite interested in giving that a try. We're actually kind of a good, good test case for that because we're we a small experiment. And so we have scattered resources. And this is basically our way to have a common software stack really at, at compute sites on two continents and a lot of it singularity and then shifter. And so far that it has worked out fairly well, especially since, I mean, Singularity has matured a lot in the, in the, in the recent years and, and Shifter now also has the, the very easy GPU support and everything. Uh, by the way, that, that script will also automatically enable as a, a GPU support for Singularity if it finds an NVIDIA driver. So um, they, we, we just try to, to lower the entrance barrier to our, like to the, especially the younger students to, to make them really use containers to make sure that we have comparable results and can help if there's trouble. Um, Mac users can, can then run the same container in, in Docker desktop and Windows users. Um, that the missing piece was really linking VS code because VS code I think in the, in the last two years has, has rapidly become the the dominating editor per button. I mean that what SS, what VS Code now can do. There's there's no editor I know that can do that, especially re remotely. Especially if you then want to do graphic plotting, data analysis, Jupyter, everything in in one environment, plus graphical Git profiling and so on. I keep hearing good things about VS Code, and I haven't quite shifted over there. Uh, 
largely because I think that the, the time I tried, my fingers kept on tripping up on wanting to use five commands. <laughs> Although I understand you can plug in uh, Vim or NVIM at least to say. Uh, no, it's yeah. insanely configurable. Um, yeah. There's tons of extensions and the web version is even, there's now also the pure web version, which is imp impressive. Hmm. Actually, one little hiccup. I think I'm going to need to uh, uh, work around. Although maybe multiple containers is a way to do this. Is that uh, I now have one of the new uh, Apple MacBooks that's got the the ARM chip instead of the x86 chip. So it's going to be a different instruction set to Corey. Like we might have too many more questions. Um, so yeah, thanks again, Oliver. That we're, oh, yeah, we do have one just <laughs> just just slipped in in time. Oh, why do we prefer shifter over singularity? I guess. So that's a good question, and it goes back to at least it used to be the case. I don't know if this is this is still the case that the security model of Singularity kind of wasn't compatible with the security model at NERSC. Um, I think Shifter actually might predate Singularity a little bit as well. And it does, it I was think. developed um, at NERSC to run uh, Docker containers. Um, yeah, so so we, yeah, it, was, it was developed with NERSC's, uh, I guess, context in mind. And it's essentially a, you know, a fork of Docker, you know, just tweaked to you know, to work in in NERSC's context. Um, I have a vague idea that Singularity's security model may have been updated and so it might not have that limitation. Anymore. I think they've they worked a lot on it. I mean, it, it it's also DOE in a way, right? It's, it's Berkeley Lab originally, and then it yeah. got commercialized and now it became uncommercialized again. It's actually now not called Singularity anymore, but the, the real version is now called, uh, I forget, uh, uh, it well. I think I did Aptana, it. it's called Aptana now. Ah, so the okay. original developers have taken control of it again and uh, want to keep this fully open source and everything. Yeah, it, it's probably his, just a historical thing, I think. And then, of course, NERSC has very strict security requirements. Though both use, um, as far as I know, both use Squash FS images under the hood that, that get basically bind mounted. Yeah. To give you to give you this illusion of a local file system where all metadata operations basically happen on a on a kind of virtual block device, which makes it really efficient. Whereas other systems like Charlie Cloud actually expect you to unpack the container, which like with millions of files, I don't think is practical. Oh, I haven't used Charlie Cloud. It's a, a interesting uh, big computing center in Munich is, is promoting it now, but I don't see how that can work with with a several million files on one container on on a cluster file system. That I don't see it. We, we definitely saw that, especially for Python workloads. Um, Shift makes a big difference to performance, and it's because of that um, you know, metadata layer kind of packaging the you know, the millions of files as, as essentially a single file access. I mean, none of the current big cluster, but whether it's GPFS or, 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 or uh, 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 I don't, I don't know, uh, Lustre or uh, Ceph, none of them like insane amounts of small files. No, I think cluster I think files large like small large files. numbers of small files. Just difficult for a for a parallel file system. You have a, a bit of a, a, a bottleneck around metadata. And I think you can you can alleviate some of it by by reducing the POSIX compliant, like not not requiring the, the, the full level of POSIX consistency. But yeah, it's a it's a difficult uh, challenge. So yeah, containers make quite a, a big difference there. All right. Thanks again, Oliver. And uh, everybody for sticking around a little bit uh, more. That was a, yeah, a, a, a really interesting demo. Thanks for that. And we'll 
post it up on the web page somewhere in the next few days. Yeah, into it.